Well, we're starting the year with our typical January series, doing something a little bit different before we do our main series for the year. So the rest of this year, we're going to be looking at 1 and 2 Peter and just preaching systematically through 1 and 2 Peter. Uh, last year in January, did the Word on, and I got you guys to throw me topics, and then we just applied the Word to whatever topics you gave us, and that's what we did last year. But this year, we're doing something else, and it's going to sound a little bit negative when I first say it, uh, but I hope it's helpful. We're going to do five weeks on five modern heresies. So we're going to look at five problems in the contemporary church. Uh, these could be areas of theology. They could be areas of practice. Uh, it will depend on the different preachers that we have coming up. But five problematic areas in the modern church. And the reason we want to do that is it's very biblical. So I just want to read to you from Acts chapter 20, 28 to 31. Now this is Paul giving advice to the Ephesian church elders. Okay, so this is Paul telling the elders what they are supposed to be doing for the church. And here's what he says. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I never stopped warning each of you with tears. Right, so this is instruction to the church, to the elders, be on guard for yourself and the church, watch out for wolves that can even come from within Christianity, be alert and warn people. So really, that's what this series is about. It's about being alert and warning people of things to be aware of in the church today. So I'm hoping you guys can really listen up, pay attention, and, uh, and be warned about things you need to listen out for. So this morning, what are we looking at? If you looked in the newsletter, it had the wrong thing, uh, and that is precisely my fault as per usual, not Glenda's, because uh, I sometimes fail to update the preaching roster, and I tell Glenda to just look at the preaching roster. Anyway, so uh, entirely my fault. What we're doing this morning is five marks of a church that you should not attend. Five marks of a church that you should not attend. Now, there are various preferences, reasons people may or may not have for attending a specific church. Are there children for my children to play with? Uh, do they have an instrument other than an organ? Is there coffee from a bulk by tin? These things are good reasons that you might not want to go to a church, right? Um, and so we have these various preference things which are kind of not here nor there. We just kind of make decisions based around those preferences. But they're not the items that we're going to be looking at this morning. These are items which go against the Word of God. And these are the things that should have us questioning or perhaps looking for a new church. Because each of these things leads to a church that is not the church that Jesus died to bring into existence, but a church made in man's image. So let's look at the first one, the first mark of a modern heresy. And I've written as my heading, the Bible. Now, I'm not calling the Bible a modern heresy. Let's just get that clear right from the start. Any church that even remotely calls itself Christian should affirm the Bible as the Word of God, completely authoritative and true, uh, and that we must obey all of the Scriptures. But the test for a church is how the Word of God is used in the church, right? It's not what they affirm in their doctrinal statement, it's how is the Word of God used in the church? How should it be used? Well, exegetical preaching should be the mainstay, the main diet of the church. What does that mean, exegetical preaching? It means the goal of the preacher is to present the Word to you in its context, and to give you the meaning that God intended the Word to have. 
The job of the preacher is to preach through a book of the Bible, looking at each verse in its context and unearthing the intended meaning that God wanted the passage to have. Right? So we work through books of the Bible. The rest of this year, we're working through 1 and 2 Peter. We'll preach verse by verse, and we will bring you the intended meaning that God intended you to have. The Bible is only true. It is only God's word when you present God's intended meaning. Right? This is what we have to be clear on. It's only true, it's only God's word when we present God's intended meaning meaning. So what's opposed to that? What's different from that? Well, topical preaching, like I'm doing this morning, and I love the irony of this, right? Uh, I'm preaching to you topically about why it's wrong to preach topically. Um, Now, what I'm saying is, there's a place for topical preaching, but it should not be the mainstay of the church. Why? Because the problem with topical preaching is, I come up with an idea, and then I rifle through the scriptures to find passages to support it. In other words, I may not be giving you God's intended meaning, I may be giving you my meaning and then finding support from scriptures to back it up and taking the word out of context. We see this happen all the time. Church, if you're a regular here, you know my bugbear about this classic passage where two or three are gathered, has nothing to do with praying and God's presence being there in prayer. Nothing. Where two or three are gathered is a passage about church discipline. It's actually about the authority of the church to enact discipline. And when the church enacts discipline, it says God will enact that also in heaven. Because God has bestowed authority on his church, he will support the authority the church has when it enacts church discipline. When two or three are gathered to enact discipline, God will enact that discipline also spiritually. That is what the passage is about. It's right there in its context. But if you happily pull that out of its context, it says something else entirely. Right? This is the importance of preaching exegetically and in its context. I've also talked many times about, behold, I stand at the door at knock. It's not an evangelistic passage. Never has been, never will be. Behold, I stand at the door and knock is God asking a church to repent, a church that has excluded Christ from the center of what they're on about. It's a call of repentance to a church. Now, do I believe in evangelism? Of course I do. But we have to look at passages in their context. This is the importance of exegetical preaching, right? If you go to a church that looks to find hidden meaning in a text. Preachers whose constant diet for you is seven steps to a successful marriage or the way to uncover more uh, authority or influence in your life, you're going to consume a diet of worldliness and you'll get fat on worldliness and skinny on godliness. Right? We, the Bible is designed to uncover God's intended meaning. I'm going to give you one really quick example of this. A church in Newcastle, where I came from, the passage was the resurrection of Lazarus. The preacher stood up there and preached from the resurrection of Lazarus. The first thing you have to do to bring your dreams back to life that have died is to roll away the stones that have blocked your dreams. So what are the stones that have blocked your dreams, right? Right? After that, what's the next thing that's going to happen? You're going to have to unwrap them. Like Lazarus was dead and wrapped in burial cloths, what are the wrappings that have buried, uh, wrapped your dreams, right? And so you're going to have to uncover them. And, and lastly, you've got to call your dreams to life because Jesus called out Lazarus, come out from the tomb. And so everyone in the church start to shout out whatever your dreams are and call them back to life. And in the church, people were sitting there going, wow, how spiritual. This is true. How spiritual. He managed to find that meaning in there. So godly. So stupid, right? That's not the meaning of the passage, and it's not God's intended meaning of the passage. And if that's your diet of church, that will feed you worldliness, not godliness. Luke 24, 27. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The scriptures are about Jesus. 
It's meant to point you to Jesus. It's meant you to help you trust and glorify Jesus. That's the central point of the scripture, right? Jesus. So contextual preaching, honoring the word of God as God intended it to be. Nothing breaks my heart more than when I hear someone say, I love listening to, say, John Piper or Tim Keller and Stephen Furtick. And I'm like, you don't obviously listen to preaching. You obviously listen to what sounds good. Because Stephen Furtick wouldn't know exegetical preaching if it hit him in the head, right? Seriously, understand the word of God. Secondly, first in the Bible, secondly, the gospel the good news, right? The one and only God who is holy and made us in his image to know him, but we sin and cut ourselves off from him. In his great love, God became a man in Jesus, lived a perfect life and died on the cross, fulfilling the law himself and taking upon himself the punishment of God that we deserve right? That is the gospel. He rose again from the dead, showing that God accepted his sacrificial death, showing that he had paid the full penalty, and he now calls us to repent of our sins and to trust Christ alone for forgiveness. If we repent of our sins and put our trust in Christ, we are born again into new life, an eternal life with God, where he is gathering a people together for himself, those who have submitted to Christ as Lord, right? That is the gospel. That is the good news. That is what we proclaim. Here is not the gospel. You are not all that you could be. You could be significant. You could be prosperous. Things are holding you back in your life. You could be successful. You can achieve all of your desires, all of these things say the same thing. You could be like God, knowing good from evil and having it all your way. Is this the good news you hear regular, regularly at church? It's not the good news. It's a promotion of worldly values. The same worldly things that Christ died to save us from. Note first and foremost, our holy God who made us in his image we sinned and marred that image, and we cannot correct it. If you don't start there, you do not have the good news, right? The good news must begin with us being made in God's image, us sinning and tainting that image, and God alone being able to save us. But don't get me wrong. As we pursue Christ, as we are molded more into his likeness, as the fruit of the Spirit bears in your life, then yes, a better marriage should result from the good news. Overcoming addiction should result from the good news. But the good news must start with our sin and the death and resurrection of Jesus. It must start there. This is why Paul said to the Corinthian church, I decided to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ, and him crucified. I decided to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the central point of the gospel. Our sin and our need of our Savior. Again, quick example of where this can go wrong in a church that you really don't want to attend. There's a Christian comic, he does comic strips called Adam 4D. Some of you might have come across him. He ran, a po he ran a poll across all of Joel Osteen's social media accounts uh, and he just tallied words to see how often they got used in a month to see which words would be the most popular coming from him. So, in 12 uses, we have dream and favour. 11, we have declare and destiny. 9, we have heart. On 3, we have miracle on one, we have vision, anointed, and abundance. And on zero, we have Jesus. Right? Jesus is the central point. Jesus is the thing that we should be talking He is the person we should talk about the most because our salvation hinges on the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
John Calvin puts it really well. Listen to this old school language, but I want you to grasp, wrestle with this. Listen carefully, right? Plato sometimes says that the life of a philosopher is a meditation upon death. But we may more truly say that the life of a Christian man is a continual effort and exercise in the mortification of the flesh till it is utterly slain and God's spirit reigns in us. Therefore, I think he has profited greatly who has learned to be very much displeased with himself, not so as to stick fast in this mire and progress no further, but rather to hasten to God and yearn for him in order that having been engrafted into the life and death of Christ, he may give attention to continual repentance. Truly, they who are held by a real loathing of sin cannot do otherwise, for no one, for no one every, ever hates sin unless he has previously been seized with a love of righteousness. Right, so what's Calvin saying about the Christian walk? He's saying, as we go on in Christ, as we get closer to Christ, we should feel continually that mortification of sin, the weight of sin. We should feel continually how unholy we actually and truly are in our life. As he says, why? So that we'll be stuck in the mire of sin? No, because as we are more aware of our sin, we are meant to cling tighter to Christ. As we are more aware of our sin, we are meant to repent and cling all the more to Jesus and so be conformed to his image. That's the Christian gospel. That's where we sit. That's where we belong. So we've got to proclaim the true gospel. So be honoring to the scriptures or the negative sense, use them incorrectly. Uh, We must also preach the true gospel. Thirdly, conversion. This is really important. A biblical understanding of conversion should recognize both what God does and what people do in salvation. In conversion, God gives life to the dead, gives sight to the blind, gives the gifts of faith and repentance. And in conversion, people repent of sin and believe in Jesus. A biblical understanding of conversion recognizes that only God can save And that he saves individuals by enabling them to respond to the gospel message through repenting of sin and trusting in Christ. And we see that again and again throughout the Bible. Jesus called people to repent and believe in him. He said in John that unless someone is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Throughout the book of Acts, the apostles call people to turn from their sin and trust in Christ. Throughout Paul's letters, the epistles, we've got this continual, uh, continual uh, reminding people that they need to repent and trust in Christ, right? There is a call for conversion, a call to be born again, a call for your old life to die and for new life to begin in Jesus. And this is crucially and critically important. Because it recognizes a distinction between those who attend church and those who are regenerate. Now, regenerate simply means you've been regenerated by the Spirit. You've been born again. It recognizes a distinction between those who attend church and those who are regenerate. Now, that's crucially important, as I said. This is opposed to a church where you're included in the body of Christ by being born into it. Through infant baptism or some other mechanism, you are included in the body of Christ by the mere fact that you attend there. Where the reality is a person could attend church for 50 years and never miss a Sunday and not be born again. Right? A church must preach regeneration. A church must preach that attendance doesn't make you a Christian. Taking communion doesn't make you a Christian. Getting baptized doesn't make you a Christian. Nothing can make you a Christian other than being born again, right? That's what Jesus said. Being born again means I die to my old life, I give up my old life, I die to its desires, I die to its dreams, I die to its hopes, I die to its futures, I die to the flesh and instead 
I give my life to Christ and I say, it's yours, you are my Lord and anything you choose to do with my life is your will because I've died to the world and its desires. I give myself entirely to Christ and in doing so, he fills me with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit begins to give me a new life in Christ being molded into his likeness where I live for his glory. That's the gospel. That's conversion. That's the difference Christ makes. So, church, we must attend churches that preach and proclaim conversion. If a church doesn't teach conversion, then they're not looking for people to be saved. If you just simply include people in the body of Christ, then we're going to have a huge difficulty with unregenerate people being included in the church. All right, fourthly, This one's controversial. This will be fun. Membership. Church membership. Or in our church, we call it partnership. Now, throughout the Old Testament, God made a clear distinction between his people and the world. Right? Right throughout the Old Testament, God made a clear distinction between his people and the rest of the world. And that flows through into the New Testament. Christ says that entering the kingdom of God being, means being bound to the church on earth. We can see that in Matthew 16. We can see that in Matthew 18. And where do we see the church on earth? The local church. Now, where it gets interesting is, where do we see the church? Oh, sorry. The New Testament explicitly refers to some people being inside the church and some people being outside the church. But it's not talking about the building. It's talking about the people of God, right? Just because Beth gets up and walks outside, Corinthians isn't saying she's outside the church. No, it refers to people who are included in the body of Christ and those who are outside the body of Christ. The church in Corinth consisted of a definite number of believers such that Paul could speak of a punishment inflicted by the Majority. The majority of the numbers who were considered to be inside the church could make a decision to exclude somebody from the church. So we see these definite ideas of who is in and who is outside the church. Now, I know for some people it's really not cool. You can't label me. It's too oppressive. Um, But the reality is, we see this continually throughout the Scriptures. I want you to think about this really carefully. When Paul calls the church to pass judgment on someone in the body, who is he asking to do that? You know, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm looking around and I think there's a number of people who are here for their first time this morning. If I was to stand up here this morning and say, you know, this person over here uh, has uh, committed adultery and they're refusing to repent and so we're going to have a vote now as the scriptures tells us. We had one person confront them, they didn't uh, confess their sin. We had two or three go and confront them, they didn't confess their sin. Now the word says tell it to the church and the church now needs to decide whether or not we exclude this person from the body. So, you who hears on your first Sunday, how would you feel about making that decision to cast someone out of the church which you've just walked into? Right? Beth and I were on holidays uh, last year now. We sat down in a church that we hadn't been into before. This is true. And the church had had a pastor for three months and the pastor had just resigned. And they read a letter out to the church from this pastor which named names spoke of extreme bullying, uh, extreme bitterness, to the point of saying, I will never work in pastoral ministry again. And it went through, and we're just sitting there going, it's really awkward. Uh, we're, we're just visiting, and here we are hearing about every bit of dirty laundry with names mentioned. Now, tell me, is that letter appropriate to be read? It is. To who? The genuine church. How do we know who is the genuine church and who isn't? How do we know who we keep and who do we exclude? How do we know who has the right to exercise discipline over other members of the body and who doesn't? We keep a list. We call that list partnership. 
right? It is those in the church who have committed to serving, growing, uh, submitting, and doing all of those things here in the local church. For a church that has no such process, no discerning of who is the body and who is not, you have the potential for an unbaptized, non-Christian who's been at the church for two weeks, voting on a budget, enacting church discipline, and, impo- and appointing elders. What a nightmare. What an absolute nightmare. Right? That's why we need a system which they clearly have in the New Testament of defining who is in, who is committed, and who has the right to make those key decisions. Right? That is partnership in this church. Lastly, Leadership. The Bible teaches that each local church should be led by a plurality of godly, qualified men called elders. And the Bible talks about this in a number of places. We get the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, Titus 1, 5 to 9. We get plurality of elders everywhere. Acts 14, 23, Acts 27, 1 Timothy 4, 14, 1 Timothy 5, 17, James 5, 14. Look, seriously, it's everywhere. You can get those references off me later if you choose. So, God has given us his idea of how the church leadership is to function. God gifts the church with elders to feed God's sheep, God's word, guide the sheep, protect the sheep, and uh, lead it under Christ. Examples of problems, the churches that you may not want to attend is leadership structures where you have a single authority. Somebody who's looked up to as having some sort of apostolic authority and whose word may not be written down as saying their word is law, but that's how it's treated. Right? The Bible never ever gives us an example of church leadership where we have one pivotal figure that everyone should obey and listen to. It's unbiblical and it leads to massive problems. If you go to a church where one person's voice is authoritative, when that one person begins to make dumb decisions, the church is in trouble, right? For our protection, for the protection of God's church, he's given us a plurality of elders, elders who together work on the running of the church. In this church, we currently have four elders. We meet together, we talk through everything, and we rely on the wisdom that God's given all four men, to be able to make godly choices. And every now and then, one of us says something which we think is good at the time because we're angry or we're annoyed, and the other guy's like, yep, that's fine, Sam, but no. Right? Because we all need at times to hear people speak reason to us. That's why God's given us a plurality of elders. Secondly, this is going to sound really funny, churches with boards. Now, what do I mean by that? There are churches out there that will affirm a plurality of male elders as leaders of the church because it's biblical and they don't want to argue with it. But on the flip side, they don't really agree with it. So what they do is they make up a board of men and women who run the church. It has full authority, it makes all the decisions, and the elders are reduced to being a spiritual cheer squad for the board. They don't actually do anything, they just sit off to the side somewhere and and supposedly pray uh, while the board runs the church. Now you can look for all kinds of pragmatic ways the churches try to set up and run things, but they're usually not biblical. It's a pragmatic church that compromises the word and lives in deceit. Now, can a church have a board that's biblical? Sure. You might set up a finance committee. Financial people, both men and women, who have the right skill set. That group must be overseen and directly under the authority of the eldership, or it's unbiblical. Right? We're going to be careful that the structures we set up follow the word of God. The other important thing about this is it counteracts the idea, which you guys mightn't have heard that much, but it was popular a little while ago, that a few people meeting together in a house, a cafe, or a pub, or a church... Right? There's, there's four of us guys and we get together at a pub over a beer and we're a church. Nope, you're not. Where is the God-given structure of elders, deacons, members, discipline, proclamation of the word, etc.? Right? You're not a church unless you fulfill the structural requirements that God has given us. 
right? We've got to be careful that we enact and follow and obey the word of God. Obviously, this is only a very, very brief overview this morning. But here's why I chose to do this. I hope it makes you think. As you travel, as you look for a church, here's what you have to do. You need to sit there and say to yourself, are the words that the preacher is proclaiming biblical and in context? Not does the preacher sound good, not does he say things that I agree with, so therefore I want to affirm him, but is it the word of God giving the intended meaning as God wrote it? Likewise with the gospel, conversion, etc., Church, be a discerning people who look through lights and music to God's Word and see if He is being glorified the way that He intended. Right? That is the mark of a biblical Christian church. And it can too easily be lost in all of the other things. All right? So if I can encourage you with anything, This is just meant to get you thinking. Look to the word, look to its context, and is that the meaning that's being presented? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that we have the word of God. You gave it to us as your objective truth. Lord, the the authority that we should base everything we do and say and preach, Lord, is based against your word. Lord, we pray for ourselves and the other churches out there, Lord, that we would work hard to unearth your meaning, your intended meaning. Lord, that we wouldn't celebrate some kind of weird spiritual device, but Lord, we would celebrate the word of God as it was intended because Lord, it's your word that will encourage us, strengthen us, rebuke us and mold us into the image of God. Lord, we just pray as a church that we would stand firm on your truth. Lord, that we would not compromise. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.